This is Marketing Over Coffee with Christopher Penn and John Wall. Good morning and welcome to Marketing Over Coffee. I'm John Wall. Today, our guest is a man that we talk about probably every other month. Over the 10-year history of this show, we always mention the chasm. We're talking about the adoption of tech and how tech companies roll out products and, and the way that affects your marketing plan. Um, and so today, I'm very excited. We have Jeffrey Moore with us, the author of Crossing the Chasm. Jeffrey, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Your latest book is Zone to Win. This is the seventh book you've done. I get, let's start. Let's go back to the chasm. Let's start there. You sold over a million copies, 27 years since that has, has dropped. What brought you to the chasm? What were you doing before you became an author? Well, so I, I was in sales and marketing and high tech for the uh, late 70s and early 80s. And in the middle of the 80s, I joined a company called Regis McKenna, which was a marketing consulting firm, the premier marketing consulting firm really in high tech. And once I was there, I got exposed to many startups all at the same time going through these, these cycles. And this pattern of the chasm sort of sh- showed up. And I kept on saying, well, we have all these great launches. Well, what happened to these companies? And they sort of like go off the radar. And so I got very uh, concerned and and curious about what was going on. And that's what led to crossing the chasm, understanding that there was a chasm in the first place. And then that that really did require you to change your marketing tactics very dramatically to cross it. Uh, So Regis McKenna, I hadn't made that connection. I know you had done one of your other books with him. Years ago, I was at uh, DCI. We used to do events and And Regis was one of our marketing automation guys even back then. Well, he wrote a book called The Regis Touch, which was the iconic book of the 80s. It was it was just it was the first high tech marketing book. He and Bill Bill David wrote one called High Tech Marketing. They were both just remarkable books and they helped us a lot. Now, Crossing the Chasm, you've talked about it a million times. So let me see if I can give a pencil overview of it. And if I'm on the mark, the huge thing is that when you have a new tech product going out, there's a small group of people that can put up with a lot of pain to, to use that product. And they will, they'll go through anything because it's so cool and because they're so excited. But the problem that companies run into is that the sales are not linear. There's this huge gap because the, the mass market needs it to be idiot proof. And they just want to be one click. They want no headaches at all. And so you end up with this massive gap in your sales process where the product's not good enough to make that jump. So you're going to language. And, of course, and I, yeah, the classic story is that uh, the chasm gets filled with VC, with all your competitors and all these dead companies that couldn't get it done. Have I hit the high no, points? It's great. It's, it's great. Yeah, for sure. And, and so the, that gap is so big, there's an intermediate step that you have to take. So when you cross that chasm, what you're looking for on the other side, the people who want it idiot proof, you're not going to get to for a while. But you want to get a bunch of people who say, well, I know there's still more work to be done, but I have a use case that is so compelling, typically because it's causing me so much pain, that if you will commit with me to solve that use case, I will work with you on the missing parts of your solution, because you're going to commit to get 100% of the solution, not only for me, but for everybody in my industry that has the same use case. Now, the next step with that was inside the tornado, which is, you know, the idea that things are good when you're kind of dealing with that small group of people. And then in the chasm, you kind of languish for a while. But then suddenly when the mass market shows up, boom. Yeah. So this is really important. The chasm and the tornado are actually the same phenomenon in reverse. So the chasm is a bunch of people talking to each other saying, are you going to do this? Are you going to do this? And they go, "Uh, not yet. Me neither. So that creates the me neither. That creates everybody saying, "Let's, let's not get out on the dance floor right now. The, ca- the tornado is just the opposite. They're talking to each other and they say, you're doing this? You're, you, you stay, you do, you do, me too. And so you go from this really funny state of nobody's doing it to everybody wants to do it. And so the challenge, and once you get to everybody that wants to do it, then your challenge is how do I grab market share as fast as possible? Because at that point, when everybody does their sort of their first time in the pool, they pick a vendor, but they, 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 that's when they pick their vendor. And if they pick you, They'll be part of your install base for a decade or more. But if they don't pick you, they'll be part of somebody else's install base for a decade or more. So it's a, the tornado is a really big battle. Now, this latest book, Zone to Win, has this idea of zone management, which is very interesting. So you've got zone offense and defense. You have two different approaches. The thing that got me is it's, you're basically a CEO whisperer here. You know, you're talking to these CEOs, that, especially large tech companies, who are not agile enough to fend off these, these younger groups. Well, here's what's going. If, I think the way to think about Zone to Win in some ways is it's crossing the chasm for grownups, meaning 
crossing the chasm is for startups, for venture-backed startups. And they have a lot of challenges, but nobody in that ecosystem is conflicted about how to spend an extra dollar. You spend it on the one big thing you're going after. Everybody, you, you, in other words, in a startup, you're all rowing in one direction, you have one goal. When you're in an established enterprise and you have money, that money has many uses and many people are competing for the same dollars. So the, your existing businesses are saying, I need more investment to make my profits in the existing business. The startup inside of your company is going, I need venture capital. I need big money to, to, to go to market. And, and there isn't enough money to go around. There's no venture capitalists to fund your, right? So you have to take it out of your earnings. And then if you're a public company, your shareholders are going, well, what, what happened to your earnings? So the challenge in Zone to Win is one of, it's, it's one of resource allocation. The playbook is actually the same playbook, but funding it inside a large corporation turns out to be a bigger challenge. Now, the good news is if you can get it funded, you can actually cross the chasm much faster in a big company if you can get people to row in the same direction. Most big companies have a big challenge getting people to row in the same direction. I want to take a moment here just to thank Stack Adapt for their support of Marketing Over Coffee. Stack Adapt is a digital advertising platform that lets you run native video and display campaigns across 50,000 publisher sites in just a few clicks. With Stack Adapt, gain access to transparent audience data, award-winning customer service, and machine learning intelligence every step of the way. Go to stackadapt.com to request an invite and start accelerating customer acquisition today. You hit a key point there that I love, the idea that for big companies, when they're in that incubation zone, you're not just funding R&D, you're actually funding a whole company. It's a lot bigger effort, and you have to put a lot more resources towards it to get it to take. It's true. So what happens in the big company is with these zones, just to kind of let your readers know how this works, there's a performance zone. That's the zone that runs your existing businesses that has to make the number every quarter. And so it's, it's very, very visible to your shareholders. That's what you report out on the performance zone. And there's a productivity zone, which is all the cost centers that you have behind the scenes that are necessary to make the performance zone work. And that's just, that's 95% of a big corporation's budget is, 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 is those two things. Maybe 5% plus or minus a couple of percent is in the what you what we call the incubation zone and as you point out that's not really an r d lab the the r d lab can create new products but incubation is all about it's all about creating new possible new businesses in other words you're trying to expand your business portfolio you're saying i want to get into a new business general electric wants to get into the software business well they're not in the software business they were in the aircraft engine business the nuclear power plants etc so you incubate the business as if it were a startup inside your company and then you scale it and and, and so the, the fourth zone is called the transformation zone and that's the one where you actually put the entire enterprise on notice we are now in the process of scaling this business everything else takes back seat to that objective. Even if you don't, even if you're in a completely different division of the company, this is our prime objective. And I want everybody in the company to follow on this because if we can get it done, our stock price is going to get a big bump. And look what happened to Apple's stock price when they added new businesses in music or new businesses in phones or, or in tablets. But if we don't get it done, if we get halfway through and we just, we've, we, we sort of flounder, now our stock price actually starts going down. And I have 56 companies listed in my book that are high tech companies that crushed it the first time and no longer exist. Yeah. And that was a key point you made is that, you know, you only need to do that once per decade to make yourself a world class organization. That's so true. I, I laugh. Well, I don't I don't laugh out loud, but I laugh to myself every time I read a critic which says, well, Apple's not innovating anymore. For crying out loud, people, they did it three times in one decade. Nobody has ever done it three times in one decade. They have, they've bought themselves 25 years of grace as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they've got spare the runway. Yeah, exactly. And this guy, they've got a lot of fish to fry with those new lines of business. It's not like they're perfect at them yet. And I, this is a point that just got driven home to me was that even the biggest company can only do one of these. Like even two is probably a bad idea. And the reason why that's the case is, it, it, look, as long as you're incubating, you can incubate three, four, five, six companies. That's fine. But when you say transformation, what that really means is we're going to take a tiny business and we're going to make it to maybe as much to 10 percent of our total revenue as an enterprise. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, you're going to take a lot of resources out of the performance zone and put them to work on this new business. But by the way, the new business is very inefficient to sell. 
the, the early deals tend to be pilots. There's a year or two when it looks just ugly because you're taking your best people at scale and you're not creating good fun. It's a J curve. You're losing money. And, and so there's this anxiety about it. So if you do it, if you do, if you only have one, it's just possible. You're probably still going to probably miss your number a couple of quarters because you've taken really too much resource out of the performance zone for safekeeping. But if you get your, your new business across the chasm and into the tornado, all is forgiven. So that's the game you're playing. But if you try to do two at the same time, that's just crazy. Yeah. And another thing that hit me with that, which a light bulb went on, which I had never even considered before, was the fact that you take, you know, maybe you have eight or 10 lines of business. The corporate goals for the, the chief executives get tied to that one transformational thing. That's the, I was kind of like, oh, now I finally get that. Well, this is interesting because this, this is a best practice, but it's not a common practice. So, the, because here's the point. If you just say to the new business, look, we love you, good luck, and let us know when you get to scale, the existing businesses will kind of turn their, they won't, they won't try to sabotage the new business, but at the margin, they'll think about their own interests first. And it just won't work. You just won't get to scale. So if you really have that situation, the answer is don't try to transform. Just don't do it because it won't work. But if you're going to do it, then you have to go all in. Now, one thing you had mentioned in the book was don't try to disrupt yourself. Uh, Many other books have done this thing of, you know, well, somebody's got to blow us up. We might as well blow ourselves up. But you make the case actually that that's a big mistake. Yes, I hate that sentence. We have to disrupt ourselves. Uh, There's a version of that sentence that I actually think is the right idea. But let me deconstruct the wrong idea first. So the idea of disrupt yourself is I would voluntarily go into my existing cash cow businesses with the new offers, cannibalize and sort of just go after it. Because after all, that's what the startups are doing to me. So the idea of somebody's going to eat our lunch, it might as well be us. It's not a stupid idea. But the problem with that is your partners don't get what you're doing. Your customers don't like what you're doing. You're exi- in other words, your install base is going, you're, you've, you're deserting us at, at a, in our time of need. So what can you do? Two things you can do. One is you can disrupt somebody else's business. That's always a possibility. In other words, if I take disruptive technology, but not into my sector, I take my capabilities into somebody else's patch. That's great. So Apple, for example, never disrupted the Macintosh. Right. It disrupted music. It disrupted phone. It, you know, it went that way. The other time you can do this, which is closer to this problem of eating your own lunch, is when your business is now really on the ropes. The new technology, your, your Kodak film and, and, and digital photography is like at the door. Now what you have to do is your, your business is already disrupted. And so what you have to do is modernize it as fast as you can, meaning you take the new technology, you infuse as much of that technology as you possibly can into your old business to make it more modern, but you're actually still doing the old business just in a more modern way. And my example in the book was Microsoft taking their back office software business and converting it to Azure Cloud. So so the cloud is the new format for back office. It's still back office software, but they now sell it through the cloud. The margins aren't as good, but the cloud is clearly the place to be. And by the way, everybody saw that Microsoft was getting its lunch eaten. With Office, same thing. Office is running on just Windows laptops. Well, a lot of iOS, a lot of Android out there. And by the way, a lot of cloud out there. So moving it to Office 365, you can run it on Android, you can run it on iOS, you can run it on Windows. So making those were both cases where they lost money significantly on the deals that they did over the three to four year period that they're converting because the enterprise deals on the old software were sweet. I mean, they built, I mean, they had the margins were fabulous. And on the new stuff, when they started with Azure, the gross margins were negative. Not the net margins, the gross margins, and they were trying to grow the business as fast as possible. But that's what we mean by zone defense. You're doing a disruption, but you're doing it to defend yourself. Apple and Salesforce are better examples of zone offense where they voluntarily go and disrupt somebody else. Yeah, right. But zone defense, that was yeah, it. Yeah. Zone, de- zone defense, I think, is the most common play. And I think, I think the key to zone defense is you modernize your operating model, but you're probably still on the same business model. It's a little, it can be a little tricky how those words work, but the key idea is you're trying to transform yourself without disrupting the relationship with the customer. And so therefore, at some level, you can't really operate. Like the cab companies in New York, you can call a cab company from your mobile. You can watch them come to you on your mobile on the Arrow app, and you can pay with the Arrow app. 
but it's still a cab that's owned by a cab company. They still pay salaries to the drivers. So it looks like Uber. The operating model feels like Uber, but the business model is totally different from Uber's. And getting that distinction in different businesses, it works different ways. But it's really important that you not try to be Uber if you're not. Right. And so is that infrastructure model versus operating model? Is that kind of the... Is well, that that's the third one. So, the, so there's actually three. There's business model, operating model, and infrastructure model. So business model is really, I'm doing the, I'm doing, I'm approaching the world with a totally different point of view. I am Airbnb. I'm going to be a hospitality company with no property in, in the world. Okay. I am Netflix. I'm going to do over the top streaming and with no TV stations in, in, in between, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that's a new business model. The new operating model is I'm going to act like Netflix. I'm going to act like Airbnb. So, the, so a lot of the, the, the hotels are trying to act like Airbnb. Wyndham Hotels has bought vacation by owner or whatever that thing is. And they're trying to do an Airbnb-like thing so that they can stay relevant. But they're still Wyndham Hotels, right? And then the third one is infrastructure model. That's like, you know, we're not going to change our operating model or our business model. We're just going to take cloud computing or mobile computing and run our existing business with our existing playbook, but better, faster, and cheaper. And that's, that's, that, that is the least disruptive. And that's, if, you're, if your sector is not being disruptive, that's a great, that's a great strategy. It's, and when the sector starts getting disrupted, that's going to be not enough. But, but, but by the way, as a way to learn about the technology, it's a kind of a no regrets first move almost up. Yeah, you're staying ahead of, of everywhere to go. Well, you're probably behind, but you're, you're, not, you're, you're, you're not so far behind. <laughs> not as far behind as you were. <laughs> Just to pause for a second, if you need developers or designers, top tail screens everyone that applies to their network and only the top 3% of the industry make the cut, check out our show notes. And for more information, visit TopTal. Another thing that comes into that that's interesting is that for the bigger established players, the idea of you only have to neutralize. You don't have to actually even be as good as the upstarts and the disruptors. This is really important. The thing, the one huge advantage that an incumbent has over a disruptor is they have all the customers. That's why the disruptor is attacking them. And so the disruptor has to differentiate. If the disruptor doesn't differentiate, it has no reason for being. So the disruptor will put all of their money around being different. If you're an incumbent and you have a relationship with a customer, the thing you want to remember is customers do not like to switch vendors. So if you can give them a reason to believe in your future, they would prefer to stay with you than switch to the new disruptor, regardless of how sexy that new disruptor is. But you have to show that you are catching the next wave at some pace. Right? So it's a little bit like the difference between winning your spouse and keeping your spouse, right? <laughs> so when you're winning your spouse, you are competing against a, a, a lot of other people courting, and you have to differentiate, and you have to win. But if you've been married for a while and you're not at each other's throats, then you, you, you don't have to be Brad Pitt. You, know, you just have to kind of keep up a little bit. You can't like it just be a couch potato. <laughs> but, you know, you don't have to be a star athlete. So anyway, that's, that's, that's the analogy I've used. Right, to go, to go with that. Now, as the executive team is looking at the horizon, you break that into separate segments, too. There's different horizons to look at that affect the way that you roll this all out. Can you talk more about that? Sure. So th this is a McKinsey model. It turned out to be kind of the key to figuring out how to deconstruct the problem that all these established enterprises were having, putting the investments in the right place. So horizon one in the McKinsey model is, I give you a dollar this year, you're going to give me a dollar and 20 cents back this year. So the, in other words, the horizon is, when do I get my, my return on my investment in you? And horizon one is this year. Nobody, everybody understands that that's how you run the performance zone. It's how you run the productivity zone. Horizon three is the far future. I give you a dollar. You say, I'm not even sure I'm ever going to give this thing back. I think it could be a great opportunity, but it's still new. So what I say to you is, OK, well, I'm not going to give you very many dollars, but, you know, I'll give you a few dollars and, and go take chances. Really, frankly, nobody has any problem with that. The problem is when you say I, Horizon two. So Horizon two says, and typically you say this when I've got a really cool business opportunity I want to scale. I need you to give me a big chunk of money this year, and I'm not giving any of it back. And then next year, if I'm successful, I actually need you to give me a bigger chunk of money, and I'm not giving any of that back either. And then the third year, I want even more money, and if this thing works out perfect, we're going to break even. And if, you know, if you're in the annual budgeting process, you go, well, that didn't seem as compelling <laughs> as I was hoping. So off the, and Horizon 2 is the problem statement. That's why you can only do one 
at a time. If you no nobody within their right mind would fund two Horizon Twos at the same time. Mm-hmm, because you run out of you you just, you, even one can have you cost you run out of resources. <laughs> right, right. The, the ground is already littered with plenty that have have just tried one and not come through. Exactly, exactly. This book is great because it it really the thing that stretched the mind for me is that you're going from just the the simpler problems, but you're taking all the way up to talk about how this company is working with the shareholders and how you can actually manage that. You had an interesting roadmap as far as when you start talking about this as you're going through the process, how to lay that out so that you don't take the, the stock hit. What's the best way to move that? Well, you are going to take a stock hit, but you, what you want to do is not get an activist investor on your board of directors. <laughs> so as, as, our, as our periodic, we see our friends in various companies do. So the idea behind this is we kind of talk about three acts. So the first act is you, you now know you're going to go into Horizon 2. You've picked the chosen business. You've made the commitment to go after it, but it doesn't show yet in your financial reports because you're early days on this big commitment. At that time, what you want to spend, the, the dialogue with investors has got to be, we're about to make a big commitment to cloud, to, well, like what Satya did, mobile first, cloud first. Well, Microsoft was not a mobile first, cloud first company, right? So he signaled everybody, hey guys, I'm going to do something big and different. And what that will cause, by the way, some investors will go, oh, I'm going to sell your stock. Okay, this is a good time to sell my stock. But other investors will go, oh, I might buy your stock. Okay, and it's, and so you, but at least you've warned the investment community, there's a, dis, you know, we're about to do construction in your area sometime soon. So just be thoughtful about that. So then the, the second one is, is when you're in the middle of this thing, it is getting ugly. And basically what you have to do there is typically what people do is, I need to get to scale. So maybe I've gotten the business, I want it to get to at least 10% of my portfolio. Maybe I'm at three, it's getting kind of ugly. One of the things you can do in the middle is make a big acquisition. And for two reasons. One, if you're a big company, you can never scale organically fast enough. So you, sooner or later, you are going to have to acquire some capability in the area. But if you make a big acquisition, in the case of Salesforce, the company that they bought for their big acquisition for the marketing cloud was a company called Exact Target. And what that did was they took them from about 1% to about 6% of their total revenue. But what it also did, whenever you do a big acquisition, investors kind of give you four quarters to sort of digest. I mean, they sort of know that you're not going to deliver right away. So you're actually buying a year of obfuscation. <laughs> you're buying, a, really, you're kind of, I mean, it's a year in which people are giving you sort of the benefit of the doubt before they give you the doubt of the benefit. And if you can make enough progress in that year so that when you come out of the third year, you're able to say, look, we're we're still not at 10%, but we're 7%, 8%, 9%. By the way, we're growing on the growth vector we're in. Next year, we will be past 10%. And then investors go, oh, okay, this is, this actually did work out. But it's a, it's a very, it's a very subtle dance. And I made it sound very easy. And a lot of times it's not that easy. Right. But that is, that's just a great point that you can't belittle because so that acquisition, everybody goes in with rose-colored glasses that the acquisition is just like the team's just going to plug in, their desks will fit right there, and everything's going to be fantastic. But really, even the CEO is going, well, even if this total acquisition fails, that's the smokescreen for the version that we're working on or what we've done. Yeah, it's interesting. At some point, what you may do with the version you're working on and you do the acquisition, part of what makes this thing work is, is you say, I've got to find a way to leverage the combination of those two is as best I can. So during the M&A process and the technical due diligence, it's really important to make sure that they're not like radically incompatible with each other. Because that often happens, by the way, because we need to be able to get to ma- critical. This is a problem of I need to get to critical mass before my investors lose confidence in me. This is, and this is the hardest business act there is. I mean, it really is. Crossing the chasm inside the belly of a whale. It's really, really hard. Culturally, there's just a massive experiment to push through. You've got to put them under fire. And of course, the, the, you literally come out with sausage at the other end, too, is that it's, the team's going to be a mishmash. You're going to get the best of both or the ones that can work together. Maybe well, this, they're not is, the this is important. So each of those zones, one of the reasons we did the zones is every zone has a different culture. So the startup has a classic incubation zone culture. At scale, running a business at scale in your corporation is a classic performance zone culture. So if you think about this zone to win idea, what you're really trying to do is take something out of the incubation zone, grow it about an order of magnitude, which is what the acquisition is going to help with, 
And at the end, you want it to be a well-behaved member of your performance zone. So all that entrepreneurial, we don't need no stinking rules kind of stuff, by the time you're in the performance zone, that's not the deal. And, and so you do, you, you slough off a bunch of people. The two founders of Exact Target, both great people, by the way, no longer there right now. And part of that is, is part of it is they're vesting in peace, which is great. But, 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 but actually, they have vested. But, but the point is, there is a change in the quality of the company. And if you're a startup uh, CEO, and you know, you say, well, I want to protect the, the magic of the company. Okay, but if you get acquired, you just gave up the rights to doing that. So, so understand what you're doing. Yeah, we have to footnote that too. Uh, Chris Baggett of Exact Target. I have known him for a long time. And he went on to Compendium Blogging Software and sold that to Oracle. So he did both Salesforce and Oracle, which is unheard of as far as I know. Yeah, I don't know well done, has done well that. done. And he's now doing farming, some kind of organic farming food service. It sounds like somebody from Indianapolis to me. That's, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> a, a shout out to Doug Carr and the rest of the guys out in that part of the country there. On our way over here, we're actually, oh, and I should mention we're in a room by Breather. So thanks to Julian Smith and all of his folks for giving us a great space to meet. But on the way over, I was talking about how you know, you are the chasm guy to us. I mean, we always talk about that, but obviously, you know, what else do you do? What else are you into? Um, and, and and before we get too far into that stuff, though, do I also want to mention in the book, you say that this is the seventh and hopefully last book in this series. So are you thinking about wrapping up the author thing or, or where are you going? Well, so on the author side, I have four book projects in mind and none of them have anything to do with business. I think the total sales from all four books might get up to 100. <laughs> so, but they're, you know, they're the, the things I want to write. And, and so they're either about philosophy or they're works of fiction or they're the other stuff. Okay. So, but right now what I'm doing is I'm still doing So I'm a venture partner at Wildcat Technology Ventures. And before that, at More David Ventures. And in that role, people who that, that VC invests in, I do Crossing the Chasm consulting with with our portfolio companies. That's the only crossing the chasm stuff I'm doing, but it's really fun for me and I get to stay in the game and, and that's really cool. So that's, that's part of what I do. The zone to win stuff is now leading to a enterprise advisory business. So I don't, I no longer, uh, I'm running any of the firms that I helped found. So it's just, it's just myself, but so there's not a lot of advisory relationships, but I do have one with Salesforce that, that Mark Benioff sponsors, which is just, I have to say at this point, to be able to work with kind of the CEOs that you have the greatest respect for, that's kind of a privilege of being at the end of your, more close to the end than the beginning of your career. It's really cool. I'm working with a guy named Doug Merritt at Splunk. I feel he's a terrific guy. I love Splunk. That's a second advisory relationship. I was doing an advisory relationship with Chi Lu at Microsoft. He's now the CEO, president of Baidu in China. There's a few things. Ericsson is becoming a very interesting, but I can only do two or three. I can't do like 10, right? So, so I'm doing the advisory relationships and then I'm doing a lot of speaking on the book because I, I do want people to know about this book. Uh, I think this notion of enterprises not catching the next wave and therefore kind of losing their, their future, it's been driving me crazy for a long time and I'm, I'm not willing to, to, to stop working until we get a little bit better at solving the problem. Okay. And so it's tech writing that you're getting away from. You do yeah. have other stuff. Oh yeah. There. I mean, I will write until they pull the pen from my cold, dead fingers. I, mean, I, I, I am a compulsive writer. Okay. And then as we wrap, what else has got you excited now? Are you looking at, at is the whole voice controlled stuff? Is anything there interesting? No, I'll tell you the, th no the thing that absolutely is, is so interesting because, you know, I'm an English major. I'm not a computer science major. Machine learning as an on-ramp to artificial intelligence, but really just this deep neural network machine learning, which to implement is very complicated mathematics, which I haven't a chance of understanding, but I'm just understanding what's possible there and why does it work and how does it work. I think it's going to be, I think for the, you know, the rest of my time on the playing field, that's going to be the most transformative force. And so I want, I want to get closer to understanding it. That's great. An absolute pleasure. Jeffrey Moore, thanks for joining well, us. Well, John, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. That'll do it for this week. You can check out the show notes for links to everything that Jeffrey's got going in his books. Be sure to sign up for the email newsletter over there so you can get these links pushed to you and get notice of everything else we've got going on. But that will do it for this week. And until next week, enjoy the coffee. You've been listening to Marketing Over Coffee. Christopher Penn blogs at ChristopherSPenn.com. Read more from John J. Wall at JW5150.com. The Marketing Over Coffee theme song is called Mellow G by Funk Masters, and you can find it at Music Alley from Mevio 
or follow the link in our show notes.